uh, my name is uh, Jason Donov. I am a senior instructor here at the University of Calgary. I started off my academic career. Uh, I left high school and I went off to what at the time was known as a junior college or a community college, uh, Bakersfield College, and I spent two years there where I was a physics music double major. After two years as a physics music double major, I went off to the University of California, Santa Cruz, where I finished my bachelor's degree. Um, and I actually sort of flunked out of the music program there. It was kind of kind of embarrassing. Um, they had a particular test that was 64 intervals from minor seconds to major tenths, ascending and descending all over the keyboard. And you needed to be able to get 58 out of 64 to pass, and I only got 54. I was shocked and horrified, so I decided to go off and study physics instead, where I also picked up a, a minor in math, and I, I wound up completing most of the linguistics requirements. And I am just a, the sort of person who loves taking classes, and I, I kept that through as I went off to, to do my master's and my, my PhD at the University of Washington in Seattle, where I got a PhD in, uh, in physics and uh, also a PhD in nanoscience. My PhD work was on low temperature forms of water that are not ice, so amorphous solid water. It's sort of like window glass. We would spray water onto a gold surface at such a low temperature that it would solidify without actually forming uh, ice. And what was really cool about that is that we would raise the temperature up so that it would start actually giving off the uh, um, giving off the water. So we were fond of saying that we were boiling water to make ice. As a senior instructor, my whole point here is to teach. I love teaching. I love interacting with the students. I got kind of burned out working in a lab. I actually didn't like being locked in an underground laboratory, slaves to machines to, to you know, eventually chase the research funding. So I've taught lots of different courses. Most of them have been introductory physics courses of one sort or another. Introductory physics courses for physics majors, introductory physics courses for bio majors, or for chemistry majors, for geology majors, for engineers. I also like teaching the, the sort of general interest physics courses, like how things work. It was one of my favorite courses to teach. We, we talked about everything from the physics of doorstops to, to how rocket engines worked and everything in between. CD players and DVD players. It was just, it was really a lot of fun. And it was so great being able to take the math out of physics and actually put in all the bits that we absolutely love. Currently, the courses that I'm teaching, there's uh, an introduction to nuclear power, which is really a lot of fun because we get to talk about how nuclear power could in fact actually both provide the electricity we need to maintain our quality of life and stop climate change at the same time. Related to that class, there's my introduction to energy class, Physics 371, which covers the entire energy sector with nothing more than grade 10 math. This class has been phenomenally popular and we're having trouble keeping up with how much the students really want to take this class. Part of what's so exciting about that is that it uses uh, an online textbook that I developed with students here at the University of Calgary, energyeducation.ca, which I am so proud of the job that my students have done with this because we're now getting thousands of visitors from around the world every single day. Why did I become a professor? Well, I am an academic because I love being on campus. I love the environment of a university. I love the fact that we're all here because we're passionately curious about a whole range of different things. And being on campus means that I can talk to people about how much art history really means to them or how much French literature really means to them. I get to be around students who are intelligent, passionate, and really, really keen to create something new and exciting that no one else has ever done before. We are not here to make money. We are here to make humanity. I love that. And I love that I have the opportunity to go from being an undergraduate student through graduate school and then relive a lot of that same excitement by sharing it with the students that I have myself. It's a hard life. And if you don't want to be an academic, it's not a good match. But for people who really are passionate, who love to be on campus, who love learning for learning's sake, academia is a great place to be because we're contributing to the world by looking at things that might seem useless initially, but eventually become incredibly useful. My father used to say that his dream job was being a cowboy, and he'd be a cowboy when he grew up. Now this was particularly funny because he was a freelance writer for most of his career. And then 
when uh, when he started getting a little sick of chasing the job, he followed in my footsteps. See, I was going to be the first uh, the first Donov to graduate from university, and my dad went back to school while I was getting a university degree, and he beat me by seven days, two hours, and six minutes. But who's counting? So what's my dream job? My dream job is actually doing exactly what I do. This job is in a lot of ways a dream come true. I get to contribute to the overall advancement of what everybody knows by taking the people who have the ability to make these advances and help their dreams come true. There's things I don't like about my job, don't get me wrong. Grading sucks and, truthfully, so does committee work. But for the most part, I really love what I do because I get to show up and I get to teach. I get to talk and people have to listen. When I was a graduate student, I remember the Nobel Prizes came out. And we were sitting around talking about the Nobel Prizes. And I had this fascinating realization that I would rather have a student of mine win a Nobel Prize than win one myself. It's kind of an interesting realization. And let me be clear, I was never in any danger of winning a Nobel Prize myself. But my biggest academic accomplishment, really, is that year after year, I have students who come to me with their problems, with their excited ideas, and then we work together. Now, I don't want to point out any one particular student because I've just had so many wonderful students in my life, but student after student who come through and struggle, and they've sat in my office and cried and worried and fretted, and by their own grit and determination, often with some help from me, they have soared. Normal people cry at weddings. I cry at graduations. As an undergraduate, I was a spaz which at the time meant I was a hyperactive, annoying kid who asked lots and lots of questions. My grades were not bad. I did flunk a couple classes. I got a lot of A's. On the whole, I was a good student, but it wasn't that I was the best student. What I was was a passionate student, and my teachers were often really annoyed with me because I wanted to know more. I wasn't the sort of student who was like, is this gonna be on the test? What I was was, wait, I don't understand. Tell me more. I spent a lot of time in office hours. That's who I was. What don't I like that students do? Beat themselves up. Students are really their own harshest critic. Success comes after an awful lot of failures, an awful lot of banging into walls. And specifically the scientific process is the process of going forward and trying things that people have never done before. We wind up telling stories about people like Nikolai Tesla, who allegedly never had any failures. And it's not only not true, those myths are harmful. The students who are going to contribute the most are the ones who fail strategically the best. And it hurts so much when I see somebody who doesn't get a perfect score on a test, and rather than learning from what that test could have taught them, they wind up internalizing them. And I see it in their eyes and I see that pain. And that pain hurts me too. I really wish students wouldn't do that, but I don't know how to stop it. What do I do when I'm not sciencing? I don't know. What's sciencing? What science? I play a lot of board games. I like spending time with people. One of the things that I've noticed is that things come in and out of my life. I used to think that I had to have hobbies that lasted forever. For many years, I was a swing dancer. I love dancing. It doesn't work in my schedule so well anymore. So what do I do now? I play a lot of guitar. What do I do when I'm with other people? I board game. I like playing board games. I like cooking. But these hobbies come in and out of my life. I can't cook as much as I used to now that I have, uh, you know, now that I'm a father. Um, so my wife takes care of most of that. That doesn't mean I don't love cooking. But it is important for me and I think for everybody to make sure that they have at least one thing in their life where they take off the hat that everybody knows them by and gets to be just them. Recently, I've been doing musical theater for adult classes. I'm terrible at it, and it's wonderful because I'm free to be terrible at something, and I'm not a physicist there, I'm just Jason. Biggest fear, man, that one's tough. I think my biggest fear is being useless. I hate the idea of working so hard at something and not having it actually matter. I want to matter. I want to contribute. Truthfully, I think most people do. And the idea of being forgotten, being useless, being ignored, I think that would, that I think that eats at me the most. What pets do I have? Well, as a scientist, there's only one pet you can have. I have guinea pigs. At the moment, I have three guinea pigs. 
their names are Gingerbread, Gale, and Dust Mob, because she looks like a dust mob. Favorite show or movie? Um, I might have to plead the fifth on this one, but I do really like Hamilton. I don't watch television, I just don't have the attention span for it. In terms of movies, I have been really enjoying the unfolding of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The very recent Captain Marvel was a wonderful addition to that, I loved that. Uh, my all-time favorite movie, quite possibly Led Zeppelin's Song Remains the Same? Not sure. Favorite junk food? Peanut butter. I really love peanut butter. Um, I always worry that I'm going to have a student who is deathly allergic to peanuts and I'm going to wind up causing them, uh, an anaphylactic shock. Um, I eat at least a jar of peanut butter every week. Three things I can't live without. Peanut butter. My guitars. My connection to the people in my life. I had spent an awful lot of time thinking that what I really needed to be was famous, and I discovered that being locally important to my community, the people that are close to me, is actually a lot more important than being important to the world at large. How much sleep do I get on average? Um, not enough. Uh, I am an insomniac, so I actually have a lot of trouble sleeping, and I'll usually get about four to, four to six hours a night. Um, and then every so often, my body will just sort of break down and I'll wind up sleeping, like, I don't know, a long time, like, you know, nine, ten hours. Uh, outside of the semester, I will often deliberately make sure I get more sleep, but I, I could definitely stand to get more sleep. When students take classes for me, in general, I want them to understand that science is a method. It is a, an approach to understanding the world around us. It is a way for us to unfold the mysteries around us. It is not a final answer, but a process by which we are getting a better and better model of the world around us. Nuclei, the nuclei of atoms, for example, we don't have one single model that works perfectly. We have a bunch of different models that we use depending on what's most appropriate. As the statistician George Box was fond of saying, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. It's important for us to take that attitude when we're doing science, to treat everything as a, this is the best we know today. Not as an ultimate truth with a capital T, but we are searching and we, are, we can contribute. When I was a kid, I used to go to the Ontario Science Center. My parents, as I mentioned in a different video, um, were writers and both my parents wrote for the Ontario Science Center. So they would, they would take me to the Ontario Science Center and drop me off and then just let me run around the Ontario Science Center for several hours, unsupervised, which I think is now illegal. Uh, but I was so upset as a kid that I wasn't going to be able to contribute to science because science had already been done. And I really wish more kids, even undergrads, understood that there is so much science left to do. There's so much good research out there left to be done. There's space for everyone. Advice for students. Make more mistakes. The biggest regrets that I have from my, from my life are when I look back and fear had governed my life and governed my actions. Someone pointed out to me that fear is often false evidence appearing real. Nice acronym. Well, my response to fear is to forget everything and run. As I get older, the more I look back on the things that I was afraid of and recognize that it was never nearly as destructive as I thought it was. This doesn't mean be foolhardy, but it does mean that when I face everything and respond, I live my life in a way of appropriate fear and appropriate senses of accomplishment. Accomplishments are not me being able to do what I could do easily. Accomplishments are when I look fear in the face and do it anyways. It's not about not having fear. It's about overcoming that fear because that's what courage is. Courage is fear faced. The fascinating thing about science jokes is that it always winds up dictating something about the field itself. For example, 
Three people who study logic extensively, called logicians, walk into a bar. The bartender says, Hey, welcome to the bar. Would all three of you like a drink? And the first logician thinks for a moment, looks at the other two and says, I don't know. And the second logician looks over at the third logician and says, I don't know. And the third logician confidently looks at the other two and says, Yes!